lovely February weather here. We're very really happy to have uh, Ryan Brandt back. It's, it's great to have you uh, back. Who's going to talk to us about St. John Fisher and the English Revolut uh, Reformation? And the uh, any minute that was a joke, <laughs> uh, um, which all Catholics will get. Um, what an interesting man! What a great saint! Unfortunately, not as well known as he should be. Without further ado, I'd like to. Uh, start with a prayer. Please stand. The face of the crucifix. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. amen. May every word and work of ours begin by thee, and by thee be happily ended through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, pray for us. St. John Fisher, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. 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 Haven't tested it. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> okay, some of you might remember uh, I was here in October to talk about St. Robert Bellarmine. So my name is Ryan Grant. Um, I have, I'm the owner and uh, chief translator for Mediatrix Press, which is mainly geared to reprint books as well as to translate, uh, translate new works into English, mostly from Latin. And um, so I've done a considerable amount of research over the years for various subjects looking at books. And so one of those has been the English Reformation. And so, which is the theme for the, uh, the series of talks tonight and tomorrow. So just a couple of matters uh, to, to clarify the order of the talk. So tonight, uh, obviously St. John Fisher, we're gonna talk about now. And then the following talk, uh, there'll be an intermission after this one Following that, we'll talk about Henry VIII, well, the young Henry VIII that nobody's ever heard about before. We're usually used to is the later, more tyrannical Henry VIII. Then uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll pick up more or less where that leaves off, with the progress into a slightly more familiar territory of the English Reformation, or properly revolution from the church. And then following that will be a talk on Queen Mary and Elizabeth and the English martyrs, and then if you, whatever else, depending on the time. Because I have some other things planned, but if it, it's going too long, I might cut it short tomorrow. So one of the, there's two themes that we're going to be looking at here. So one is the question of myth. History is a complicated animal, largely because you have a, it's a body, it's a science, and we take it as a science, but we fail to notice many times that what's given to us as science is actually really nothing more than opinion. So in the English language, when we look at our Catholic heritage, we have a very large barrier in the form of the Whig narrative of history, so-called, which is, uh, to put it, that's a scholarly way of saying, the victor wrote the history, and the victor wasn't us. So as a result, we tend to have certain notions about how history form that's been written for us by those who don't have the interest of our faith at heart. So the response to that is to go into the historical sources and show what, what's there to be found that actually tells slightly different, a slightly different story than what we're used to. So one of the themes for this is going to be uh, disabusing ourselves of certain myths. The second one is going to be a question of uncovering characters that history has decided to liquidate that is to entirely get rid of. Dr. John Rao uses this phrase when he talks about history. He talks about people whom the secular historians have decided should just be gotten rid of because they don't fit the narrative. So the narrative of the English Reformation is, well, it was a church that was uh, you know, heavy in abuses and out of touch with the people and you know, people wanted a new piety and then you know, well, Henry came along in spite of you know, his bad side. He did a good thing. He gave the people the Bible in English and everyone was happy. End of story. Oh, some bumps on the road and of course there's Thomas More, unfortunate. You know, oh well. That's the historical narrative more or less. Uh, in a nutshell for Henry's reign. Although, because you'll notice that many Anglicans, to their credit, will look at Henry's reign and say, well, we really don't want to say he was that great, and that'll be clear especially tomorrow in the first lecture. So one of those characters that secular history has decided to liquidate, to remove from the references of any particular biography or historical documentary, is St. John Fisher. <clears throat> 
So John Fisher was the only bishop, as some know, that uh, to, in English, the whole of the English hierarchy to refuse to bend the knee to Henry in his new plan for the church, and specifically his, his uh, annulment from Queen Catherine, which was not sanctioned from Rome. So he refused to bow down to that, but he wasn't a corrupt bishop, he wasn't a backwards bishop, he wasn't a dark age medieval backwards thinking person. He was actually one of the biggest humanists of the day. And he was also a reformer. He was also a man of the people. He came and preached to all of the people, no matter how lowly their class and state, in an age where many bishops didn't even reside in their dioceses. In other words, Fisher was the very epitome of reform, but the secular history is telling us that that's exactly what he was standing in the way of. So he just, he just doesn't fit. So he's just got to be gotten rid of. So we're going to un-get rid of him tonight. Moore, on the other hand, everyone's heard of Thomas Moore, and he's one of those unfortunate bumps on the way that, well, he could be secularized because he was a lawyer, he was a layman, and he had you know, his wit and his merriment, he wrote in English, and so he makes the case in the secular narrative of conscience, but Fisher of religion, which you can't secularize, so we just have to eliminate. Okay, so Fisher was born in a place called Beverly in uh, 1469, though there's some controversy about the date, and this is in Yorkshire, right, to the northern part of England. So Beverly was a mercantile town. His father was a mercer, he traded in wool primarily, and left them a very, uh, very good earnings for his family. The, he, this was the age of the, what historians later called the War of the Roses, which is a complicated narrative, so we'll spare the details so to get to other things. But principally what happened, you had two rival claimants for the throne. One is the Lancastrians in the person of King Henry VI. The Henry VI is everyone's seen Kenneth Branagh's Henry V, perhaps correct, uh, with uh, his great invasion of France and his victory at Agincourt and so many things. Well, Henry VI comes to the throne. It's the same time that Joan of Arc has engendered the French reconquest of their own country, and the English depart. And Henry VI says, well, I'm going to take this money, and he's very devout and he's very pious also, and he says, I'm going to put this money into monasteries, we're going to fund church music, we're going to fund um, new works of art, and the nobility's really not happy about it because they just lost their blood and treasure fighting in France that now the king is kind of left alone. So the result is various noble houses get together and try to determine, well, who could run the country better? And that's the House of York decides, well, we could do it better. So they fight for it. Edward and his brothers end up winning the struggle. They kill King Henry VI. And as a result, then they rule. And then they're ruling at this time in 1469. I'll bring the sequel up in just a few minutes. John Fisher, on the other hand, born in the midst of this, didn't really see some of the horrors that the rest of England saw during the conflict because the town was just too important. Neither the Lancastrian side nor the Yorkist side could afford to alienate the very powerful mercantile town. So they kind of left them alone, left them independent, and so John Fisher's family flourished. His father died while he was very young, but leaving behind a lot of money, he was sent to a grammar school. Now, grammar school in the uh, medieval synthesis is slightly different than we imagined it today. So this is from the University of Paris, actually. And this is a middle school. This is where the, the young burgeoning scholars, before they get to the, uh, the, where they would take their courses and doctorates, they would, uh, just after learning their basic course of arts, they would come up to the next level, where they get trained in argumentation and other things and tested. So Fisher first started off with what's called the trivium. And since the Roman times, this had kind of been the backdrop of your formal, the beginnings of your formal education. And it starts with Latin. Latin is the language of education. It's the language of church and state, right? So if you know Latin, you have an easy made job no matter where you go. If you don't, start time to learn a trade because that's what you're going to be doing. So Fisher is extremely brilliant in Latin. He becomes fluent very early. So he progresses to the next stage, which is logic. So if Latin is learning how to speak in the language of education, logic is learning how to speak correctly in the language of education, again, in Latin. So your logic, you learn what follows, what makes sense, and what doesn't make sense. And then you progress to the next level, which is rhetoric. So if Latin is the language of education, logic is how to be correct when speaking, 
rhetoric is how to sound very good while you're doing it. And properly, so we hear the word rhetoric and we think of politicians using the nice words to kind of hide truths and hide realities. But the ideal of rhetoric, reaching back into classical Greece and Rome, with figures like Demosthenes and Cicero, the idea of rhetoric is actually to make beauty in speech reveal truth and make it more clear to people because of its beauty. So then Fisher graduated from the grammar school and moves on to the next stage, which is called the quadrivium. Now, the quadrivium is four particular sciences that, that uh, carry on to the next level. So music, okay, music will be one of them. And uh, likewise, <clears throat> excuse me, um, arithmetic, okay, arithmetic is very important. Um, they didn't have algebra at this time, but you would learn um, basically all the, the normal skills of counting. And in the Middle Ages, you see banks where they had young boys that learned arithmetic, do it, keeping the books and calculating millions of dollars in trades and other things in the various houses of merchants and guilds and banks, very rarely is there ever a mistake found. Compared to today, and you go to the grocery store and the person puts in the amount wrong, they, they have trouble giving you the change, right? Because they didn't have things, they didn't have social media to kind of clutter, out their, clutter up their minds so they couldn't think clearly back in those days. So anyway, so after mathematics, then you progress to natural sciences and above all, astronomy. So, so the natural sciences consider God's world. Astronomy considers the heavens themselves where God dwells. And so there are very complicated tools. This is a medieval depiction of the use of an astrolabe, which we'll talk about a little more in the next talk. So the, um, and then after that is philosophy, principally metaphysics. So once you've seen the heavens themselves, the next philosophy upward is metaphysics, which from the Greek translates roughly to beyond physics or beyond the natural sciences, beyond what you see. So Fisher was really brilliant in all this. He won scholarships, so his family uh, promoted him upward. And in this time, this was a wonderful thing for a family, and he decided he had a vocation to the, to the priesthood and he wanted to test it. And in those days, you did not yet have a seminary. So if you thought you were called to the priesthood, for the most part, unless it was an apprentice system in the local church, where really, this happened in many places too, where you would go to the priest and tell him, and so he'd kind of take you under his wing, and, and if you per persevered in, in a good life till you're 16, you got brought in the orders and tonsured, and uh, you might not know very much, but you'll turn out to be okay, possibly. Or you went the university route, and you went to a school of divinity, where you were, got your doctorate, and then your ordination, and this is what Fisher does. So he was sent to the University of Cambridge, which at that time had suffered greatly from the Wars of the Roses. And the Wars of the Roses in general in England brought about a great destruction of learning and of other, um, other amounts of progress that the country was making toward becoming a, more cult a bigger cultural center. And instead it falls backward for a time until the conclusion of the war. Fisher then, would, after taking his doctorate, became a reader in one of the houses, which meant that you, you kind of governed this particular schoolhouse, and you would see to all the readings are being done very carefully and being incorrectly, and people were following the right things. In theology, in those days, what you did is, you, if you remember the earlier picture, let me go back, the master of the school, there we go, would sit down and he would give you the, you know, the, the question of the day. So it would come from the sentences of Peter Lombard, who was an 11th century theologian, sorry, 10th century theologian. So the questions of Peter Lombard would then be laid out, they'd be put down before the students, and there'd be a particular one that would be chosen. So the magister, the teacher, would come down and say, okay, you defend it, and you, I want you to argue against it. And they would have to do it. Again, practicing all the skills and the tools that they learn early on. So Fisher, as he passes from taking his doctorate to becoming a master himself, would then be in the chair directing young students to do this very thing. So he has a fortuitous uh, happening for himself. Get over here. In the year 1489, when he was examining uh, a major problem, major conflict between the University of Cambridge and the city of Cambridge, which wasn't you know, always a good relationship. The university town, um, you think of rowdy university students today, right? Well, in those days, it's less than the rowdiness. It's more the university appropriating lands in the town, seeing more and more 
of its lands going to the university. So during this dispute, they went to go seek help from some lawyers in London, and while at dinner, St. John Fisher met this woman, Lady Margaret Beaufort. So she was the queen mother, and uh, the, that is the mother of King Henry VII. So she comes into the picture during the end of the Wars of the Roses. Henry VI had married her to a relative, Owen Tudor, and they had a young son, Henry. So when Edward uh, the, became Edward IV and killed Henry VI, her son, Henry, had to flee because he's the last of the whole Lancastrian line. He had to flee to France, where he stays and expects to stay more or less the rest of his life. Edward IV is gifted with an heir and a spare. That is, two sons, as they had to use the terminology of those times, not trying to be coy. Um, and so he's got his main heir, Edward, and then his second son, Richard, just in case anything happens to him. So that's that they used to say, the heir and the spare. So Edward then, Edward IV, dies very young. Then his two young sons, technically, are the heirs, and his older son, Edward, becomes the king. In the protection of his brother, Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. Right, and so he ends up becoming King Richard III when the boys suddenly mysteriously disappear. St. Thomas More writes in his history of Richard III that the boys were taken to the tower and they're uh, brutally put to death. They're strangled in their sleep. So that's what he records in his history, um, <clears throat> which is more than probable. So as a result, the princes in the tower are out of the way and Richard now is king. And that annoys a lot of the Yorkists, most especially the two young boys' mother, Elizabeth Woodville. And she goes to Margaret Beaufort and says, if your son Henry comes back, I'll marry my daughter to him, and we'll, we'll bring a unity here as long as he beats that, that cruel man that killed my sons, more or less. So Henry comes back with a French army, wins the Wars of the Roses, and becomes king, and Lady Margaret Beaufort becomes queen. And you see this if you see, if you ever go to England and you see various Tudor monuments, you'll see a rose, usually a red rose with a white rose inside, right? The House of Lancaster with the House of York. And it symbolizes the marriage of Henry VII with Elizabeth of York. So that's what more or less what ends the Wars of the Roses and brings Henry VII to the throne. So Lady Margaret Beaufort is very pious, Henry VII very much less so. He's a great patron of learning, and he does many good things for England at this time, one of which is to bestow upon Cambridge several grants of royal favor and help rebuild various buildings. So Fisher now is <clears throat> in a much bigger position in the university because of the patronage link he has with Lady Margaret. She's so impressed with Fisher when she dines with him because he's truly a priest that loves Christ and has zeal for souls in his very heart. So therefore, she makes him her confessor. So now he has an inroad to the court, and since his position becomes so important, Cambridge makes him the provost of the university, which is a very great position to be in for a very young man, such as Fisher was. Henry VII also notices his holiness, and in spite of his general um, vices, Henry is noted for being a miser. He's noted for uh, killing various nobles on the very subtext that they might be plotting against him. So he's, he's not very much loved, but he is very much feared. But he starts to soften largely because, he, one, he loves his mother, and he sees the holiness of Fisher. So ultimately, he decides to make Fisher a bishop. Um, okay, this slide is out of order. Get back to, I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. So Fisher then becomes the Bishop of Rochester. Henry VII formally declared that the appointment wasn't made because his mother told him to. He made it very clear that Fisher's holiness, his learning, and everything else recommends him to this position. So we should say something, too, about the type of learning in this, in this period. So we mentioned the medieval ratio studiarum, okay, that is of the trivium and the quadrivium. Then there's also something else called humanism. Humanism was basically a, it means something quite different today than it meant back then. So in those days, the term humanism was usually called the new learning. And what that meant was a return to the sources, classical Latin, classical Greek especially. Italian humanists had been very big on looking to Cicero as the exemplar of Latin speech. And that held out pretty much as long as Latin would be taught up until the, about the mid-20th century, where Cicero kind of became the gold standard for how you should be speaking and writing in Latin, which is somewhat artificial, but that's what worked principally in that, in that Renaissance period. 
Fisher also becomes a patron of the new learning, and he starts again his in earnest with the church fathers. For a long time, theology had been kind of caught up in scholastic questions. Not uh, We had sold this false bill of goods. When you hear about medieval theology, they say, oh yeah, they debated angels dancing at the end, end of a pin. Okay. And I'm sure everyone's heard that phrase once or twice before. Actually, the medievals never did that. That was a sneer that was made up by a German philosopher in the 18th century to describe medieval philosophy as saying, that, oh yeah, it's all about stupid things, angels on the piano, things like that. But it's simply not true. Nothing like that ever was discussed. Although scholasticism does have its low points as well as its high points. But one of the things that had been neglected was history, and secondly, the fathers, the fathers of the church. They hadn't been altogether neglected. St. Thomas Aquinas was very devoted to the fathers, especially the Greek fathers. And of course, if anyone's ever read the Catina Aurea, you've seen St. Thomas synthesize these great, great many quotations from the Greek fathers and their commentaries of the Gospels, right, as well as the Latin fathers. But not everybody did this. And so Fisher was very much moved to look to the fathers of the church and to try to reinvigorate theology with a focus on them. <laughs> and so as bishop, he becomes a patron of learning, and he becomes uh, great friends with some other figures. So this fellow, John Collett, is an extremely important figure in the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages. He's a reformer, much like Fisher. He sees various abuses in the church. The biggest one was Episcopal residence, and this is a theme that comes up throughout the, this period. Bishops often became bishops by patronage, not by merit. So when Henry VII declares he's going to make Fisher a bishop because of his merit and learning, you would start, you'd wonder, well, shouldn't all bishops be made bishops that, that way? It, well, it didn't really work in that fashion. Instead, if you, were, you had friends in court and you were looking for a job and you were seen as sufficiently useful or came from noble stock or what have you, or you know, whatever other reasons might there be, you could become a bishop. And the Pope didn't really much mind in these times, because the Popes were becoming very great patrons of art in Italy. Uh, Pope Julius II famously would go to war because he needed to pay for Raphael and Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, and it was extremely expensive. So one of the things the papacy had derived, which made sense in the time in which it was initiated, but at this time it kind of had overgrown itself, is a tax called the Anates. The Anates was a tax that every bishop, upon becoming a bishop, would pay his first year's income in the diocese to the Pope. And so then the Pope would then have this money, and of course he wouldn't get it directly, it would go to bankers who then would have to extend their credit to their you know, fellow companies in Rome, and then the Pope would draw on that credit and the interest would be absurd. But that's how this kind of situation worked in those days. So one of the things that reformers like Collett, and ultimately Thomas More and John Fisher, and many others, were talking about was the elimination of things like anates, the elimination of royal patronage in the selection of bishops. Because this was producing bishops who were pliant and loyal to the crown and not preachers of the gospel, as we shall see. Okay. So Fisher, as Bishop of Rochester, immediately took his duties very seriously. The first thing he does is make a visitation of his whole diocese. And the priests were actually rather shocked. They weren't expecting this because it hadn't happened in about 70 years. So the, uh, the bishop had come around and taken note of accounts. And he quickly got a reputation for a very just and holy man because wherever he went and there was obvious injustice being done, he reversed it, right? He would actually put clerics, he would, uh, um, put clerics back to the lay state if they were unworthy, if they were taking money that, that didn't belong to them, if they were ignoring the spiritual needs of the faithful, right? He would actually you know, fine them or whatever else. If they didn't amend, then he would have them reduced altogether to the lay state, just get rid of them. And he personally ordained the vast majority of priests destined for his diocese, even, even to the annoyance of some bishops elsewhere. He would make sure that the priests were preaching regularly, or if they couldn't preach, that they would be given instruction how to, or given the, the tools on, on managing it. Fisher himself would go about his diocese preaching. While he was provost at Cambridge, Lady Margaret Beaufort had commissioned a special chair of preachers that would go around preaching missions throughout the country, and Fisher was in charge of it. So now he took his considerable work preaching both for the court and preaching these missions to preaching to the people. And so one of the main, um, that's the cathedral in Rochester, by the way, it's the same one that was there in Fisher's day. Um, 
Okay, I put these slides slightly out of place. Oh no, I skipped it by mistake. So one of the great themes that he would preach on, if I can get back to it, no, would be the seven penitential psalms. That's a cover for a modern version. Tudor spelling is very interesting, but it's also very difficult to parse. And so this is the only modern edition that has in modern English Fisher's expositions given in English, which also was unusual for any sermons to be published in the vernacular. Fisher knew how to exactly how to preach to the people. He would extemporaneously make translations from the gospel or from the Psalms or whatever he needed in a certain verse in order to help the people learn the scripture. This is one of the, the other myths of this period that were always told. Oh, well, people in the Middle Ages, they weren't allowed to read the Bible. The church was trying to control it. The church chained the Bibles, the church so nobody could get them. Actually, that's a myth too, because that comes from Henry VIII with the English Bibles chained in the church. So that it didn't actually happen in the Middle Ages. But nevertheless, the church steals the scriptures and keeps them away from the people. And we've heard this time and time again. It's still taught, it's still in history books today. And Protestants still allege it against the church. But it's actually the other way around. People could not read. So even if you had a Bible for them and gave it to them, they, they wouldn't know what to do with it, right? Because the economy of the times didn't allow for it. So the reason there's no demand for more literacy is because printing of books is only just started to come around in Fisher's time. Before that, it was a monk sitting at a, a lectern such as this, and he would have another lectern in front of him that was taller, and there was one book, and here he had his vellum manuscripts that he was copying on. And if he made a mistake, He'd usually be whipped for it because the vellum was very expensive. So he'd have to be very careful. So you always had monks with very trained hands that were very careful and didn't make very many mistakes. Although they did, because you have certain things in text criticism we call copyist errors, when they copied the wrong word. So in that, but that's how you made a book. And it would take you, for very large books, 20 years. Okay? So how do you get a reading public when, the, every, when you have a book coming out every 20 years or so? It's simply not really a possibility. And they're very precious, they're very valuable. The average people could not even afford them. The nobility often could not afford them. If you had like a prayer book, you would be passing this down. And we'll see this in the next talk. Prayer books that are passed down from generation to generation. So the way you learned your scripture was in preaching. And Fisher was the master preacher of this period. Very much in the tradition of medieval preaching, but nevertheless with a great heart for the salvation of the souls of the people. He said, if I don't preach to the people, I will be damned. Imagine people saying that today. <laughs> the uh, Fisher is careful to use very uh, allusions to people's everyday life, and this permeates his exposition of the penitential psalms. So then, on, on all the issues that are covered therein, he makes note to the daily experience of people who hunt. He shows also his experience growing up somewhat, where he makes reference back and forth to the things people deal with every day, and then gives them scripture that they will memorize, because people had much better memories. They didn't have TV, and much better, they didn't have cell phones and other things. Okay, we already passed him. Get back to where we should be. So Fisher, quickly gains this great reputation for preaching, as well as for holiness as a bishop. So in 1510, when Lady Margaret dies, he is selected to preach at her funeral. He had also preached at the funeral of King Henry VII in 1509, and before all the lords of the realm. And so these, ser these uh, sermons quickly became famous, and they're also very influential. Even down to the rest of the century, St. Robert Bellarmine was heavily influenced by the Latin accounts of these sermons which came to him about people who had everything and then lost it very quickly. Fisher makes in his sermon for Henry VII allusions back to Pompey and Caesar and ancient, uh, ancient figures that had great riches, but where are they now? And so he's able to give a very good motif on having, you know, having it all but really having nothing without touching upon King Henry VII's vices so as to offend the new king, even though nobody really much would have minded. Uh, Lady Margaret Beaufort was a, different, uh, was a different figure altogether because of her singular holiness. And his sermon shows the great love that he bore for her as this incredibly holy woman. And that his counsel to her was always, always to you know, basically continue doing what you're doing. As I, I, I'm not that holy. This uh, Lady Margaret frequently read The Imitation of Christ. There were three books in English and not four, so she translated the fourth book 
uh, from the French edition. And she used to practice translating French devotional books into Latin. Okay, in her, in her spare time, she would hear four masses a day, usually, and uh, she lived entirely celibate. So she also left a lot of money for Fisher to begin building various other colleges. And so at Cambridge itself, he built St. John's College, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the next person to talk about is this fellow. Who's ever seen this portrait before? Who knows who this might be? Oh, only three people? Okay. Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus of Rotterdam. Very famous figure, uh, very interesting figure. He's actually not supposed to exist. He's a, he's a non-person in the workings of the Middle Ages because he's the son of a priest. And so that, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands actually, in Rotterdam. So he uh, grows, is sent to a monastery and to basically disappear as children who are not supposed to be there are expected to do. He hates monastic life, but he's very good at Latin. And so he escapes the monastery and becomes a secretary to a couple of nobility uh, throughout in its succession. And so he's more or less free except that he also likes to live lavishly and he doesn't have the budget for it, so he needs to take on students, one of whom is Lord Montjoy, um, <coughs> the Earl of Pembroke, also a very good friend of Thomas More. So Erasmus is actually brought to England originally to meet Thomas More, but later in 1507, he becomes very good friends with St. John Fisher. One of the things Erasmus had worked on was Greek, and Fisher recruited him for Cambridge explicitly to teach Greek. In those days, Greek was something that had just come back to England, principally at Oxford, but Cambridge is very weak in its Greek studies. Throughout Europe, if you could teach Greek, that was kind of the new Latin from our standpoint. Greek, uh, if you were a Greek coming from Constantinople and you made your way into Italy and you, you had uh, qualities as a teacher, then you had a job pretty much for life and would be rewarded very handsomely for it. So Erasmus gets to Cambridge and in the midst of it, he's working on a great project, which is to put out a Greek New Testament. And so the Greek New Testament was a, um, a, a difficult work. The, uh, there were older manuscripts, and nobody was really sure what the right manuscripts were. So Erasmus was working on what he claimed would be this great critical edition of the Greek. But it really wasn't. He was working on it mostly in England. And he didn't have access to very good manuscripts. So for instance, when he gets to the book of the Apocalypse, he just retranslated the Vulgate back into Greek and then made his own translation into another Latin version out of the Greek to make up his Novum Instrumentum, as it came to be called. So, uh, so other sections actually weren't that bad, but the Apocalypse was a particularly bad one for that reason. <laughs> so the other thing is that he found out midway through the work that Cardinal Jimenez in Spain, who was also a great reforming cardinal, a great humanist, which is another thing we're been told that, oh yeah, you know, it took Martin Luther to reform the church. Right? And that's a statement that we should simply not accept. There were many, many great reformers, great scholars, great thinkers in the church at that time that were still working on reform in spite of, and it's true, that the popes and many bishops and certainly many kings were not that interested in reform. But it couldn't be ignored, and increasingly it was the order of the day. It didn't take a schismatic and a heretic to reform the church. What it would have taken was holiness and continued scholarly efforts of these great reformers to be allowed to continue, and that would itself would have reformed the church. Schism and heresy instead broke the church as we see today. Did not, Luther did not reform the church. Okay. And we'll get to Luther in a little bit in the course of the, this talk. So the next thing anyway, so the, no, Erasmus finds out that Cardinal Jimenez is, is formulating his own Bible. Not just the New Testament, but even the Old Testament in a great grand polyglot Bible, which would have the Hebrew on one side, then in a column, then the Greek, then the Latin. And in the margins, great notes for the Chaldean and other Latin versions or notes where manuscripts disagreed. And the notes were so useful that even if you didn't know Chaldean, that is um, the Peshitta, the Syriac, and if you didn't know Hebrew, these notes were still very useful to you. It was, a, it was a far superior Bible to what Erasmus was putting out. So Erasmus finds this out. So he taps on some of his cardinal friends, including Cardinal Wolves in England, to get their friends in Rome to put the ban on Jimenez's Bible. <laughs> <laughs> then he publishes his, and then they release the ban for Jimenez. That way Erasmus could be first. <laughs> 
He's a very sneaky fellow. So anyway, so John Fisher in his diocese knew every last corner of it. We mentioned some of these facts. So he regularly preaches to the people. So houses that were too smoky, this is according to an early source, so it's called the early biographer. Nobody knows exactly who he was. It was written up in the 1550s during the reign of Queen Mary and published uh, out of the country during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. It was just called the, to the early biographer's account. So houses that were too smoky so that none of his servants could abide them, Fisher would stay with people who were dying in these houses, making sure that they were ready to meet the Lord and that they were satisfied and had received the sacraments of a anointing, something you don't read about any other bishop in this time. And so that day I mentioned that earlier. He was known to say several times, if I preach not to the people, I shall be damned. So from his very modest income, Rochester was the poorest of all the dioceses in England, and so it had the smallest income. But after he had taken care of his household servants, who lived far better than he did, we might add. They had new beds and new furnishings. And when the king went through to take, seize all his possessions, they characterized everything as old, and they couldn't even find a suitable mattress. That is, there was nothing for them to snatch away as plunder. So anything left from Fisher's uh, you know, salary, he gave to the poor. Also, one thing he didn't like was, um, it was sneaks and scoundrels that would try to take advantage of his generosity and charity. So he would actually come and look view documents and sometimes and distribute the alms himself just to make sure he could see who he's giving the alms to. So he knew if people were coming back for double dipping or if they didn't really need them, he would make sure to castigate them. So <clears throat> if he was not making the rounds around his diocese, then he was in his library studying the, studying the fathers of the church or reading other things. Now Cambridge had actually loaned to him their library and so that he would have it for his possession. And it's unfortunate that when he was put in the tower, Henry VIII confiscated the whole library out of spite, mostly as Cambridge hadn't come out as strongly in favor of him as he wanted. Um, so anyway, the next thing is he was modest and lenient in his dealing was with heretics. And we'll talk a bit about the types of heretics you had um, in those days in a little bit. But what's recorded is in Rochester itself, even today, the diocesan registers are still there. And you can view how John Fisher dealt with heresy cases. He never burned a single heretic in his entire uh, term as a bishop. His motto was, I shall, if I find a Lutheran, I shall make him a Catholic or he shall make me a Lutheran. Yeah, there was no compromise. He was not going to be, because it came from a love of souls. He's not going to let this person go, certainly go to hell for heresy. He, he couldn't tolerate it. So St. John's College, Cambridge, okay, and this is actually, St. John Fisher oversaw the very building of this gate to St. John's. Uh, as a, uh, a Catholic priest, formerly an Anglican priest in St. John's College, Cambridge, in the 19th century, Father T.E. Bridget, was studying the history of the university while he was preparing for his doctorate there as an Anglican. And as he studied the history of the university, he studied more about its founder, John Fisher. And the more he read about John Fisher from the primary source documents, the more he was convinced that this was a holy man and he was in the wrong religion. So he didn't take his doctorate at Cambridge. Instead, he became a Catholic priest and later wrote the very first biography of John Fisher, which is one of the things that put him on the map and challenged the official Reformation history. So John Fisher is the rector of St. John's, <clears throat> as well as the chancellor for the whole University of Cambridge. He established a seminary there, seminary there in all but name. He wanted a school specifically devoted to priests. As we mentioned before, if you're going to get a doctorate in divinity, then you would go to this or that university. You would get a doctorate in divinity after studying theology. You might have a number of other people in there, but it wasn't a school devoted to training priests. It was a school devoted to giving you a doctorate. So Fisher wants a school devoted to giving you a doctorate that is designed to make you a priest. And that's what St. John's College, Cambridge, became. So it anticipates many of the reforms of Trent in this regard. So he also established the new learning, that is humanism, with diligence <clears throat> in Hebrew as well as Greek. So he made sure he had readers in Hebrew, readers in Greek, people who would lecture in these subjects so the students could learn. And they were also made to live an upright life. Curfews were enforced. They were not allowed to see women. Actually, the official statute says he was allowed to see a, a, a woman no more than once a quarter. Um, why, if you thought you were going to be a priest, that you'd want to see a woman more than once a quarter? Nobody knows. But um, in any event, he keeps this careful training in place. Okay, and he was so much loved by the faculty that when Henry VIII sent Stephen Gardner to get a, 
uh, judgment for the university in favor of the annulment, they gave him a very mixed uh, review. One, so that they not t anger him too much, but at the same time in memory of their, their chancellor, they didn't want to offend him very much. So he was very much loved there. And as I mentioned about the books just a second ago, um, which were confiscated by Henry. Okay, so more about heresy. Uh, her England did not have any noted heresy until the coming of John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was uh, a priest and he was passed over for various bishoprics by less worthy men. So he got very angry about this, as according to a couple of contemporary accounts. So he also then became anti-clerical. He decided that th there's problems with all of these people running around, you know, to in the, but just raking in the money. And he was probably right in some of the things he was seeing wrong. But his, res his response is, oh, well, I know what we have to do. We have to get the Bible to the people in English. And so Wycliffe, actually, from his own resources, comes up with a, a team of translators that translate from the Latin Vulgate into English. But there's two things they do. One, they have so much reverence for the Latin that they refuse to make it into good English. It actually reads like in, in English the, in Latin syntax, which is very disorderly. And so it was difficult to understand, although it would have been very new. Hey, Holy Writ is almost in our language. But the next thing is, like people who came after him, he desacralized a lot of the words. So where priests appeared, he used the word elders, right? Which obviously, and this is what the Protestants do in their Bible, especially William Tyndale, in the Geneva Bible, right? They, they want to make sure to desacralize the language, where you see episkopos in the Greek, and antistes in the Latin, you see overseer the fellow in charge, like any other fellow like us, not, not anything particularly sacred. He held that the Pope's office uh, was, was valid as long as he was morally good. But if he was morally bad, he couldn't be a member of the church, which actually is an ancient heresy of the Donatist, right? Only the pure can be members of the church. So he can't have office. So Wycliffe sends, uh, you know, but again, England's illiterate for the vast majority outside the nobility. So he sends pre someone who is literate with one of these Bibles, which again, were very difficult to produce, very expensive. And they would read from them in the towns, in, the, in, in various places, and people would come around and listen. So they were in a general sense called the Lollards. And so the Lollards persisted even after John Wycliffe was arrested and burned and the, the movement itself was put an end to. Interestingly, Again, the church was not against putting out a Bible in English. It was against putting out a Bible that taught a different theology by its subtle changings of the words in translation. And this is the very thing that Wycliffe had done. So it set the progress of the English Bible back a couple hundred years. John Collett, who we showed before, was actually translating significant sections of the Bible into English with ecclesiastical authority so as to be a guide for preachers. And, and again, he was licensed to do this. So Wycliffe was burned, and this is in the year, and this is in the thir uh, 1300s, and late 1300s. And but the Lollards, you know, are around, and they have little forest enclaves, and they would kind of pass down their knowledge to the next one. But the problem is they'd lost so much of what Wycliffe actually taught. A lot of it just became a lot of babbling nonsense. So St. John Fisher would have some of the, these uh, people hear teachings from Lollards in the woods, kind of shouting out a bunch of nonsense. And instantly, one of the things the diocesan records show is he would recognize it was nonsense. And so he would give these people the lightest possible penance so that they would have to make a pilgrimage to the cathedral on foot or something like that. And then once they got there, they'd be absolved and that would be it. Uh, whereas other places, they might have been put in jail or something else by a less forgiving bishop. Um, so now in John Fisher's time, uh, the, we have a couple of popes. Who's, when he's born, uh, it's still Pope Eugene IV, then it becomes Alexander VI. Um, after Alexander VI, you have a short-lived pope, and then Julius II. And Julius II took his name after Julius Caesar, rather than Pope Julius I, the early martyr. We'll mention him a bit in the next talk. So uh, anyway, so he, again, you know, wages wars and commissions indulgences in order to pay for great art and other things in Rome. He also was trying to rebuild St. Peter's, which, you know, to his credit, because he's often demonized for this, and of course, I happen to like the old St. Peter's better, but it was also falling down. And it was, a, it was an architectural decision. Do we let it fall down? Can we build it up? Or why don't we build a new one? And this is, of course, where Julius II's uh, thoughts of grandeur came in, where he said, hey, let's build a new one. Let's have a palace of, Domi of, uh, a palace of Domitian built on top of, a, you know, underneath a Pantheon type of building, which actually, in a certain way, is kind of what he got. But 
he dies and Leo X comes into an empty treasury. So he's the first Medici Pope. His father was Lorenzo el Magnifico, Lorenzo the great Medici of uh, Florence. So um, he comes in and says, well, God has given us the papacy and let us enjoy it. Oh, but I am kind of short on money, aren't I? So he commissions, he looks at what Julius II did with indulgences, which was uh, essentially extending it out to, you know, rather than it used to be significant money or lands that you'd have to give in order to earn certain types of indulgences. Now, you just give a certain amount of money in specie and then that was done. It was perfectly okay, so it seemed. Other reformers didn't like this, so Cardinal Jimenez, we mentioned earlier, he ripped up the bull of indulgences from Leo X as soon as he came to Spain. So these were nev this was never done in Spain. It's one of the reasons why Spain felt the Reformation much more lightly. Not so much the Inquisition, which was actually hated and feared even by the clergy, it was rather, there was no cause, because this kind of thing didn't happen. So Leo X commissions indulgences, and he presides over a generally scandalous papacy. Right? Even in, as much as people have tried to defend him, as he did condemn Luther, which was good, it, it, there are a lot of things that were very bad, and this is one of them. So he sends a man named Tetzel to go to Germany and preach indulgences there, and he goes to Wittenberg. And after preaching several sermons on indulgences, as Tetzel was a Dominican, he transfers the right of commissioning indulgences from the Augustinian monastery to the Dominican. So as a result, the uh, Augustinians weren't too happy. So a certain Father Martin Luther, whose studies were funded by indulgences, had his uh, superior come to him and say, I want you to look into this, because we're not happy about it. And the result was the 95 Thesis. So Luther, um, so that's actually a later uh, portrait of Luther by Nicholas Crana. Um, so Luther starts the 95, uh, the Protestant Reformation more or less, with the 95 Thesis. And most of it was Catholic, although it was meant to be a public disputation. So when he, na he nails up the 95 Thesis, that actually signified a public disputation was going to be held. And people were rather addicted to these, even if they didn't really understand what was going on. And so it was a lot of fun. Let's come watch. Let's come watch those doctors debate about stuff. And Dun Scotus, for example, did the same thing with his uh, notice of his debate on the Immaculate Conception. He nailed it to the cathedral doors of Notre Dame. Right? So Luther's not doing anything particularly revolutionary here. But what's revolutionary is afterwards, he becomes a cause celebrate. Nobody really likes this whole problem of indulgences. He's now you know, the man of the hour because he's challenging the whole system, even though most of what he said was actually Catholic. And thus he kind of gets swept up by the cult of personality, and he moves further. He starts off as a reformer, much like John Collett, much like St. Thomas More, much like uh, St. John Fisher, but then starts moving in a different direction. So he's, uh, he comes up with various articles which seem to him to be the right way, of, right way to go. And uh, certainly articles on, of course, faith alone is in his nascent form at this time, but he has you know, a number of articles on justification, on the papacy itself. Right, where he argues against the papacy. As he sees that he's not getting very much traction in Rome, he starts getting more radical. So Pope Leo X, in his bull, Exerge Domine, condemns Luther. And Luther doesn't take it lying down. So here, he's burning the Pope's decree as well as the whole corpus of canon law as a uh, reaction. So this brings King Henry VIII onto the scene. So this is about 1520 or so, where Luther burns up Leo the, uh, X's bull and reasserts his articles. And the, uh, so Henry writes a book, the d treatise uh, on the defense of the seven sacraments against Martin Luther. Okay, and that's from the original printing. That's the dedicatory epistle to Pope Leo X. So Henry, was a decent theologian, he was a very good scholar, he was probably one of the most well-educated kings to sit on the English throne. And so when he arrives in, in this position where he's looking at Luther across the channel, challenge the Pope, he sees a chance to become a, you know, to make his mark on the international scene in learning, right? So he musters his considerable learning, which was good, but he was not a theologian. So with Thomas More editing his papers, he sends this to various theologians that then make judgments on it, add quotations to the fathers and other things. Uh, after uh, Henry broke from the church, this was a bit of an embarrassment because in no uncertain terms, he swears that the Pope is certainly received the supremacy over all the earth. Okay, and so then it, this is pretty embarrassing in 1534. 
So the regime tries to blame it all first on Moore, while Moore is in the tower. And Moore writes a letter explicitly to Henry, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, not to, sorry, to Cromwell, where he explicitly shows what he really did in this whole thing, and he was just kind of editing. And the next thing is that when that fails, they try to blame it on John Fisher. And that's been the most sticking uh, bit of propaganda, because today people still try to argue Fisher actually wrote the treatise on the seven sacraments. When you read Fisher's Latin and you read Henry's treatise, they're completely different authors, they're completely different treatises, the structures of the words, the style of argument. Henry's is obviously a well-instructed layman writing in very good Latin, uh, about the, the issue at hand, whereas Fisher is writing as a theologian, like a theologian, to demolish the arguments of Luther by an accumulation of all of Luther's positions and smashing them with every known argument, something that Henry does not do. So the following year, Henry sends the book to the Pope very, very quickly, and the Pope is so pleased he sends Henry back the title of Defensor Fide. Right, is, or, uh, sorry, Fide Defensor, FD, you see it on English coinage today, Defender of the Faith. And so Henry has a whole uh, pageant drawn up to celebrate this, right? In, in front of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, he has St. John Fisher preach a sermon against the, um, the pestilent heresies of Martin Luther, the pernicious heresies of Martin Luther. And then, so Luther's books are burned ceremoniously. The bull is formally published in England, Exerge Domine. And then Henry's book is shown. So as Fisher's talking about the heresies of Luther on the sacraments, the natural interlude comes in, and then he pauses, and Cardinal Wolsey stands up, waving the book around. So everyone applauds and cheers, and is, you know, it makes great pageantry. All right, and so uh, Luther gets very annoyed about this. Uh, so he writes a, a response uh, against King Henry VIII, and in it, he doesn't really answer any of Henry's arguments, and I don't have time to go into them, unfortunately. So he instead, he just hurls a lot of abuse and a lot of uh, uh, cursing and uh, foul-mouthed uh, talk in Latin at Henry. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, Henry, formally as a king, as against decorum, he can't publicly take notice of this, so he has more to it and Moore was a privy counselor at this time. So Thomas Moore writes his response to Luther under the name of Juliemus Rosses or William Ross. Now it happened to be that a, a, a William Ross had gone to England on pilgrim, or from England to Rome on pilgrimage and died there. So people assumed that he had actually written the book. They didn't know until later it was actually Thomas Moore. And what Moore shows is that he was just as adept at using Latin swear words as Luther was. <laughs> So he makes an apology at the beginning for the nature of the work, but then, right, and, and then delves into it to defend his king. And of course, it, he's, you can tell he's very irked as he's writing it, the things that Luther had written. And of course, he gets each, equally vitriolic. It's still actually, for Thomas More scholars, this is a very troubling document because it's a very embarrassing one. It's one of the few that they haven't translated in the official works of More <laughs> because, because there'd be too much blacked out, probably. Um, I don't know if anyone knows a certain, uh, a certain curse words in Latin, but some of them are not very good, so I won't, uh, I won't indulge in them here. So John Fisher enters the fray on behalf of his king. And I put this one first to talk about, this one actually comes later. He held it off in the hopes that Luther might actually convert, but when it was uh, to revert to the faith, but when he saw that wasn't going to happen, he went through to publish it. So this is the confutatio, or the re uh, rebuttal of the assertion of Martin Luther, that is his reassertion of his 41 articles. So Fisher here takes each article and quotes it at length, and he establishes ten truths whereby Luther must be vanquished, and which he may not refute and still bear the name of Christian. Okay, so one. So these go in order. Uh, I'll, I won't read them all because we're running short of time. He, you know, I lapse into error by persons relying on their own abilities to interpret Scripture. So he covers the historical cases where people doing the very thing that Luther is doing fell into heresy and, and schism. The need for some authority to decide the controversies in Scripture or in dogma. Okay, that's the next point that he takes up in the articles. Um, the impossibility of solving all controversies by Scripture alone. Okay, is scripture a judge of controversies? This is the very point upon which St. Robert Bellarmine would pick up his whole treatise against Protestantism is on this question of the Word of God. Can the Word of God solve all controversies? And why that can't happen. Okay, sending uh, and in the presence of the Holy Spirit to teach the truth vis-a-vis -vis these errors and that this is done uh, 
in the church by the fathers. The Holy Spirit uses the church fathers to extirpate heresy. Okay, and so we'll skip a bit here. Um, there we go. So he quotes, These, O Luther, are the weapons of Christians which we will use against the public enemies of the church. You can reject none of these if you suffer yourself to be called a Christian. With them, ecclesiastical custom, apostolic tradition, general counsel, or approved interpreters, you will be struck down whenever the scriptures are lacking. Okay. So all of these things have been used by the Holy Spirit to vindicate Catholic truth. This is my translation from the assertion, the assertio. And it's a very lengthy book, the assertio. It goes on for about 800 pages in Latin. He quotes Luther completely in the assertions and then gives a response. So it's, uh, it's one of his works that a lot of, in his own time, most, most of the other writers, uh, such as John of Eck, John Cochleus, many other uh, Catholic writers said, wow, this is a wonderful work, this is an excellent work. Writers today don't think it's necessarily the best, partly because it's tedious. It goes into, again, quoting Luther at length and then responding at length for 800 pages. But on the other hand, it's a very useful guide if you want to know what Fisher's theology is at almost any point apart from the Trinity and the Incarnation, which were not in doubt between him, Luther and himself. So this is the Defensio Sertiones Regie Contra Babylonicum Cativitatum, or the defense of the royal assertion against the Babylonish captivity, that is Martin Luther's treatise by that title. In that book, uh, Luther argued that the seven sac the real sacraments of the church, of which he starts out saying there were three, and in the end says there were only two, uh, but, but maintains it in the same book, um, you know, they were kept captive by the church in this Babylonian captivity, and now have been set free by none other than himself with the true gospel, which comes to him direct from heaven. Uh, wow, didn't you know? And then uh, for Luther, then it's only the bread and baptism that remain true sacraments. At first he starts out saying penance, and then later he says, well, no, no, not, not penance either. Although he still advises penance, but he doesn't hold it to be a sacrament. So Fisher uh, writes in defense of Henry VIII's book on the sacraments now, formally. And deal, first he deals with this book of Luther's. So he disproves Luther's claim to receive revelation from heaven. And he shows this by his erroneous errors. Now this book is also written in Latin. It's also never been translated. Um, it's the only one of his that I've, besides the defense of the priesthood, that I've actually read through cover to cover, where he covers all these things. But um, anyway, so he, that he dismisses as useless Luther's attempts to clear himself of Henry's charges about his self-contradictions and his attack on the papacy. Okay, and then he covers these other matters, transubstantiation most especially. He does an expose of Luther's evasions and lies in regards to Henry's defense of the mass and other things. So Fisher, though sterner in tone than his other works, slights Luther's book in nothing but his insults, which make the king appear more brilliant by comparison. Oops, fast typing on the notes, sorry about that. So then, the memes take over. Uh, this one that I saw floating around Facebook one time, but it really perfectly encapsulates how Fisher is, is dressing up Luther, you know, what Luther says. So Luther is essentially saying that for 15 centuries, everybody got it wrong, but now this prophet got it right. In the, the, uh, his work, De Babylonica Captivitate, Luther says that I don't care if you give me the witness of a thousand Cyprians or a thousand Augustines, for none of them are as holy or as righteous as I. There's a, <laughs> a great sign of humility. The next book, which was actually published at the same time as his work, um, the, the, the Defense of the Royal Assertion, is Fisher's Defense of the Priesthood, uh, which you'll also find at the table back there, if I could be allowed a shameless plug. So the Defense of the Priesthood um, starts out with this very great line. There have been published to the world from Luther's printing press many books which I have pursued with great grief, for I found scattered throughout them so much of that poison by which innumerable simple souls day by day are destroyed. Yet of all that I have seen, none is more pestilential, senseless, or shameless than the one he entitles the abrogation of the mass. For in it he tries utterly to destroy the sacrifice of the body and blood of Christ, which the church 
has ever held to be most salutary and the chief object of devotion to all the faithful of Christ. Tell us what you really think. Um, so far from being considered a witness of the gospel, Luther here is actually rather a forerunner of Antichrist because his whole goal, it appears to Fisher, is to abolish what Christ, Christ's actual sacrifice among us daily right, for the remission of sins that is bringing union between the soul and Christ. And instead, he's separating Christians, as it seems to Fisher, into schism and heresy, which where they will certainly die. And for that, according to Fisher, and likewise Moore and all the other reformers that are still Catholic, this is going to be murder, basically. It's worse than murder. Because murder, you kill the body, but the person might go to heaven. But if you kill the soul for Fisher and for Moore and others, that means you're, they're going to go to hell. So now in this one, like in the, the, royal assertion, the defense of the royal assertion, he couldn't actually quote Luther verbatim which is the way Fisher normally dealt with things. So because they, he couldn't quote all these insults to his own king uh, in print, even in Latin. So Fisher gives three rejoinders to Luther's arguments. Right? And actually, what I'm going to do is for time is I'm going to skip it, also because the book is in English, and, and, and it's also in the back, uh, even if you just want to browse it. Um, but anyway, so through these axioms, through these things, he shows his, his constant witness is the New Testament. He's frequently quoting the New Testament to show again and again that Christ did establish a priesthood to offer a sacrificial mass who have charge of everyone that's under them. And so this is a rather important point of Fisher's theology. Um, so the next um, point actually, and I'm going to skip this one too to get to other uh, matters, is the treatise on the truth of the body and blood of Christ. And this is actually his best book. It's also very lengthy. Uh, it's about 200,000 words, although a third of that is him quoting his opponent, Ocolampadius, or Johann Musch. Now, uh, Johann, in those days, it was const, um, kind of a constant thing to have a Latin nom du guerre. So Ocolampadius, or a Greek one. This is a Greek one. So he writes, he's a humanist scholar, a Lutheran, and he disagrees with Luther, but sides with Zwingli against Luther's belief that Christ is present in the sacrament. Now, Luther doesn't believe in transubstantiation. Luther believes in what's called consubstantiation. He believes that the faith of the people caused Christ to be present in the bread. That's what Luther believes, right? And of course, I'm sure you'll find people today that believe that, that unfortunately are Catholic and go to Mass and other things that just have not heard better. So Ocolampadius and Zwingli and others, Karlstadt, they didn't believe that at all. They believed it was merely symbolic and there was nothing of all, at all of value in the Eucharist except something that, well, Jesus said do it, so we're going to do it. So he goes through to quote a number of church fathers but only in snippets. In fact, he misquotes them or ignores the context in which they are quoted. It was very unscholarly, even though Ocolampadius is generally considered to be this unanswerable Lutheran scholar. So Fisher has to um, demonstrate, and he does uh, masterfully throughout, that Ocolampadius has just simply misused the sources, and he does it by giving the full context of the quote. And he even uses editions of the Fathers that were edited by Protestants and one by Ocolampadius himself, which has the very quotes that he cut. Uh, not very good. So also in one of those masterful treatises, I hope somebody translates this one soon, uh, because it was, it was a very beautiful treatise on, and also evinces Fisher's devotion to our Lord in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So nevertheless, this was, that was his last treatise, his last theological treatise. So Fisher remained the holy bishop in England. He gained a reputation by these works as being Luther's greatest op opponent. He was actually called the Pugil Evangelii, or the, the Gospel's boxer, if you will. That is, the Pugil is like the contender, the fighter. He's getting in the ring with Luther and defending the Gospel, essentially. And he's also noted all throughout Christendom for being the holiest bishop. Okay? But then 1527 comes, and there's the king's great matter. And so Fisher is instead drawn into a rather different conflict. And we're mostly talk about this tomorrow. But once he's made an a, a attendant to Queen Catherine in the Legatine court, he starts studying this with great earnestness, the question of this annulment process. And he starts studying everything from the original bull to the questions of, of uh, Leviticus versus Deuteronomy and these other verses Henry is citing. And he ends up writing about eight books, although the notion of books is a little different than today, little books in treatises. And when during the Legatine court, when Catherine refused to appear, 
he stood up, even though he knew he was putting his neck on the block in a few years, quite literally, but at the moment, figuratively, he knew at this moment that he's more or less signed his death warrant. He got up and defended Catherine when nobody else would and with such force and rigor that the ambassadors all wrote home, there's a number of testimonies to it, that everyone's kind of in awe about what Fisher's done here. So he had the absolute courage. Moore, on the other hand, we celebrate more often as the defender of marriage, but Moore actually had very little to do with it. Moore, as High, Lord High Chancellor, was officially in a position to defend the, the annulment proceedings, but in fact disagreed with them, and he told Henry as much, and that he would f further Henry's interests, but not here. He won't speak against them, but he won't do anything for them. So Henry agreed, and when he got too intolerable for more, he resigned and decided he'd go to private life. Fisher was the one daily writing and preaching against these, this supposed annulment and never stopped doing it up until the act of succession was published. He stopped simply to obey the law. Plus, he had a new problem that Cramer was now his archbishop and technically his ordinary. So he was watching his steps a little more closely. But at that point, it was also futile because Henry had also married Anne Boleyn. But these, <laughs> these causes and cures still worried upon him. In a speech before the legatine court, he declared that he was prepared to die for Christian marriage even as John the Baptist had done so before Herod. And this provoked a very angry rep reply from Henry through his minister, Stephen Gardner, who you know, uh, made a mockery of this whole thing. How dare you call the king Herod? But did they remember a few years later that Herod had killed John the Baptist? Nevertheless, um, the spiritual consolation, um, which I'm not going to have time to finish this either. The spiritual consolation was a treatise that Fisher wrote in the tower. Now, he didn't have his books with him. He was treated far more harshly than Moore was when he was in the tower. So he only had a few, a few books, his New Testament and uh, his breviary, and that was all he had. He was stripped of all his possessions, uh, of his diocese, and of everything else. So his best attempts, uh, which are still very good, it's just not as full of his citations as his work normally is. And it was written to his sister, who was a Dominican nun, who ended up dying in a convent in Antwerp when she, she fled the country after Elizabeth's accession. So he wrote this letter to her to focus on all things in Christ, and it's a masterpiece, actually, in the fruit of, sp of his lifetime of preaching the gospel to the people to get away from the things of this world. When he was in convocation before Cardinal Wolsey and others, and they, they all wanted to give an attaboy to themselves about how well they, they were doing, he would get up and declare that the people hate the clergy because the, you know, when the clergy tells them to run from the world, you run to it, right? And Fisher made a life of doing the exact opposite. Instead of running to the world in pomps and, and ceremony, he declared that in St. Paul's time there were many golden preachers, but few golden chalices. Today there's many golden chalices, but no golden preachers. So he always remained that very golden preacher, even to his death. And he refused to give up the supremacy, so <clears throat> to, uh, to swear the oath to Henry's supremacy, to give up the, the true doctrine of the Pope's supremacy in all matters of religion. So Fisher was martyred on June 26, 1535, by Henry VIII. And they tell us that, and we'll talk about this again tomorrow, so if, you, if you we're skipping too through many things, don't worry about it. We'll get it in more detail then. But Henry <clears throat> had him killed, even though he was a very old man, and when he was stripped to go down uh, to, be, to have beheaded, the people all gasped because he was basically a bag of skin and bones at that point. His austerity, as well as his sufferings, had left him largely with nothing. And there's a very despicable scene in, uh, if you've had the misfortune of watching it, I don't recommend you do so if you haven't, HBO's The Tudors. For its, uh, it, I don't recommend it for obviously it's, it's blasphemy and it's blatant pornography and bad language and all the other things we could list about it. But their scene about Fisher is completely wrong. They depict Fisher getting up on the scaffold and, and, and declaring, now he doesn't have the strength, so please help me die. I can't do it. That's not the John Fisher that went to the scaffold. It's completely made up by HBO's directors. The real Fisher got up to the scaffold and declared that he dies for his belief in his uh, remaining in the true Catholic faith and asked for the people to pray for the king that God would send him a good counsel. And then as he went to the block, the axeman knelt down and begged his pardon and asked him to forgive him. And he said, just do your duty correctly, and you'll have all the forgiveness that the next life can give. And so Fisher pardoned him and then laid down on the block, and then the axe head fell. Fisher didn't produce any miracles in life, but he certainly produced one in death. His head was, or two of them actually, 
his head was brought to Anne Boleyn. Now, this is an early account. I've never found a historical source to back this up, but it, nevertheless, it does appear as it's worth telling. We take it for what it's worth is that Anne Boleyn ordered the head that spoke against her so often to be brought to her and looking at it she wanted to see what he would do now that he was dead so she slapped it but one of her fingers was cut by a tooth that just happened to be sticking out and uh, the wound according to the source which again I can't verify but uh, was festering and bleeding and continued to do so and was only healed with great effort right about the time that she herself went to the, the to be beheaded by Henry when she had uh, outlived her usefulness so nevertheless, Fisher's head was taken to London Bridge and put on a spike where traders' heads went. And then in that time produced a beautiful smell of roses. And you have to understand what kind of miracle this is. In London in those times, you didn't have very good sewers. And so when people uh, had to go to the bathroom, it was simply left in the street. And then you paid muckrakers who got paid very well, but usually died very young, to muck all this stuff out of the street. So London Bridge, of course, had housing on both sides, so they could also be turned into a fortification. So there, there was uh, the same on London Bridge. So if you went through, that, that's mostly what you would smell. And instead, there was an overwhelming, powerful smell of roses all throughout, the, all throughout that area. And people remarked upon it all the time. Anne was hated, Catherine was loved, and this was yet another sign of uh, you know, Fisher's holiness. So Henry decided instead of leaving his head there for six months, he decided after two weeks it should be thrown to make way for Mr. Moore. St. Charles Borromeo, the great reforming cardinal of Milan, kept a portrait, two portraits in his cell. One was of St. Ambrose, his predecessor in the See of Milan. The other was of St. John Fisher, the holy reforming bishop of England. All right, he never he forgot to put him up as a model. St. Robert Bellarmine, if you ever read the controversies, there's some volumes in English, and then if you ever read them in Latin, he always refers to the holy martyr of Rochester, or holy John Fisher. And he cites him in letters, he cites them many times when St. Robert Bellarmine himself was made a cardinal and a bishop. He studied the life of St. John Fisher to see what bishops would do to take inspiration. And lastly of all, we get a testimony from the Council of Trent. Fisher was the premier theologian of his age, and he was almost a posthumous puritus at the Council of Trent. For all the scholars there asked, well, why do we need to talk about the Eucharist or justification? The John of Rochester already talked about it. So then they would put his doctrines down, and actually Fisher's teaching on justification helped formulate the Council of Trent's teaching on the same subject. And in the Acta, which you can find in Monzi, there is an I.O. Roth footnote, or actually in the marginal notes, for uh, many of the discussions, that's just the Latin, Ioannis Rafansi's John of Rochester. And so the Trent's decree on bishops also is replete with references back to John Fisher. So that essentially when the Council of Trent gives its decrees on what bishops should be doing and how they should behave, it could be reduced to four words. Be like John Fisher. Thank you. So uh, we'll open it up for a question and answer, and then we'll also uh, be ready to do book sales in the back. We'll have about a, yeah, we went over time. We're going to have about a 10 minute or so break if you need to get up or um, anything, get a drink of water or whatnot, and then we'll start the last one for tonight. Yes, sir? No question. Um, is it fair to say that uh, St. John Fisher lived on in the Council of Trent? More or less, uh, for those times, and you could even say he lived on a Robert Bellarmine and other, Victoria and other writers who referenced him so much. But over time, you know, he became uh, less and less remembered until once you get to the 20th century, there was a resurgence of interest, like I mentioned, with T.E. Bridget, who published a biography on him. And then Father Vincent McNabb also published a bi uh, biography, which was mostly hagiography, but it was very popular. We also have it in back there. Uh, because it is hagiography, and it's, very, it's based on Bridget's work, though, so it's based on the real history. And then Reynolds wrote a history that surpassed Bridget's, and it, turned, it was also based on the state papers and documentary sources, which also is in the back. And uh, no other biography has been written on Fisher since then. There is one on his theological work, two on his theological works. One was by Father Edward Sertz. It's called The Works and Days of John Fisher. The other is uh, by... Um, Rex, his first name is Rex. I can't remember his last name. Or maybe his last name is Rex. Richard Rex, okay, that's right, Richard Rex. Um, it's about $70, but it's called the 
The Theology of St. John Fisher. It's also an excellent work, although it's very pricey. So the, um, it's the only book that's still in print apart from the ones we have at the, the table there. So, but for whatever reason, he's been completely eclipsed and largely because when you look out to the secular history, you find Moore, and you find Henry, and you find Cromwell, and you find Anne, and you just don't find Fisher. It's just like uh, pictures, like pictures of old, the old Soviet, you know, regime around. And after uh, Stalin would liquidate someone, they'd be airbrushed out of the official pictures. So they weren't there anymore. It's more or less what the secular history has done with Fisher, and as a result, it's just less kind of in our minds. Yes, sir. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we could? Um expand the portrait of secular history and get these people written back in, even if you're a person who won't, if you're encountering people who won't exactly be reading all these wonderful books you got back there. Right. Because, uh, I mean, there's so many assumptions in that, or so much background you would need to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking to somebody who's coming from, from the post-propaganda era, mm -hmm. Like how, how do you it's difficult because there's a lot of, the, I think history is on our side on this in as much as there's a lot of young historians, especially in England, and they've kind of shed the whole Whig narrative of history. They've kind of, kind of take, gotten rid of that, and now they're just interested in what do the primary sources say. And they only get to some of it because they're, they're largely post-Christian. They're not particularly, uh, they're not Catholic, they're not Anglican, they're not particularly anything, maybe slightly aware, you know, they know about the faith, but it's only as a historical box that they examine it in like anything else, like you, like you look at Buddhism or something else that you don't believe in. So as a result, um, they'll look at some things but not others, but they do challenge things. And so I think the key is to get someone who has those abilities to get to, that can go to state papers, that can read the contemporary manuscript writings and the history, to start writing history that reincorporates Fisher or Catholic media to produce uh, documentaries. There is one um, in England. It's called Mary's Dowry Productions. If you're familiar with it, and they do a short little documentary. Well, they're not exactly short. About 20 minutes or so, uh, mostly on YouTube. And they have one of Fisher that's about an hour and a half, which you have to buy. But um, it's not a scholarly documentary. Like when I say a scholarly documentary, I think of I don't mean the History Channel, or otherwise known as the Nazis All the Time Channel or something of this sort. But the BBC principally. Uh, for all their errors and their factual problems at different times, they do produce very good documentaries. But actually, this gets to kind of what we're talking about. They produced one on this period, on Henry VIII, and they took something that John Fisher said and put it right in the mouth of the Archbishop of Canterbury as if Fisher didn't even exist. And uh, which was odd. Was that a failure in the research? Did he find it in a secondary book? Or did he make the decision, basically, to continue the liquidation of the bishop? You know, I don't know. I hope not the last one, but... That's kind of how the how these things tend to progress. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're talking about the big history, and you know, I can see this point of view happens in the Protestant point of view, but within the church itself, which is a bot bastion, you know, people have had these commemorations of right. Martin Luther uh, with Pope Francis. I didn't follow that to any in any detail. Was there any inkling that they were aware of any? I don't think they, they understand at all, frankly, um, to, to put it the right face on it. So um, Pope Francis wrote in a book while he was a cardinal. It was a discussion with a Jewish rabbi, um, Rabbi Skorka, if I have his name correct. Uh, but it was discussions, and, and then he talks about the Thirty Years' War in such a way where he clearly doesn't have the faintest idea what it was really about. As a, from a historical standpoint, whatever else he meant to say about it. And it seems that I don't think he properly understands the Reformation. He looks at it from a level, well, I love Jesus, and you obviously, as a Bible Christian, love Jesus, right? So therefore, we can all come together. And that seems to be the way he's approaching it. So the problem is uh, that's not the way it actually is. And especially when you look at Luther. Now, actually, I have some friends who are Missouri Synod uh, Lutherans, and they were absolutely very upset when Francis did that for two reasons. One, they're like, why is he meeting with the most liberal Lutherans possible? Why isn't he meeting with us? We're real Lutherans, we're conservative, you know, and that, that, was, that was his first uh, bit of being upset. The second one was, well, why does he want to do that? It doesn't make any sense. I'd much rather see the Pope embrace Catholic, you know, heroes and, and argue for their position than come over because that just looks to me weak and he really wasn't impressed by it at all. So, and I know another uh, Protestant that feels the same way largely. So it's, uh, but it follows the 70s doctrine, we're going to, you know, more ecumenism. And the problem is, as we've seen with Fisher, 
Luther really is not the witness to the gospel. In fact, he tried to remove a book from the New Testament where the canon was absolute, regardless of questions in the Deuterocanon canon and whatnot. At least James was sacrosanct. And Luther came up with, as John Fisher shows actually, very pithy reasons for getting rid of it. In the beginning of the defense of the royal assertion, Fisher quotes Luther saying that, well, James can't really be an epistle, uh, a canonical epistle, because he doesn't mention the, Reforma the, the resurrection. And then Fisher says, well, really? Well, what about Titus? What about, uh, oh, you know what, uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians? Oh, you know what, Second Peter doesn't mention the resurrection. Hey, why don't we get rid of those too? And so it's really these pithy reasons for getting around the fact that in the Bible, there's one place where it says faith alone, and it says it doesn't save you. And Luther couldn't deal with that. So that's not exactly someone I'd pick for the witness to the gospel, but all that's lost because it's a great political soundbite that somebody wrote and they ran with, and that's kind of really how it works at that level. So it's something to pray about more and lament than to, I guess, complain too loudly about. Except, uh, you know, unless everyone was doing it, that would be a bit different. But when we see it as such as it are, where people are kind of, well, you know, maybe he is. And, and the thing to really do is pray. Does anyone else have a... Mm -hmm. uh, knowledgeable Catholics, just going relatives, <laughs> and, 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 and at a high level. And, and, and this guy did the same thing, but it was at the political level, very high political level. Whenever politics enters into the, into the fight uh, with violence, the truth is always compromised severely. So I'm, I'm just seeing how the two men go together. You know, I guess it just goes on. I, I'm, I, it was one of the questions. When, when he uh, was going through his studies between his entry into time, uh, middle school, you said, mm -hmm. to when he ended with uh, metaphysics, how long, what was the time span? Would have been from the time he was, <clears throat> he was about seven until he was about perhaps 14 or 15 before he's, uh, he would have been accepted as a student in Cambridge. Okay. And, and how, how did theology end? Was theology still considered at this time a higher level? Of yes. It's the queen of the sciences. And that was the case. Up, well, essentially, that was reflected um, until the French Revolution, basically, and all the university setups in Europe. Even Protestant theology treated it that way. And then after the French Revolution, you kind of have the birth of a very secular outlook and the idea that we create our, we'll create our own framework for dealing with the world now away from religion. So philosophy temporarily takes the place of theology as queen of sciences. And then after, as the, the French Revolution rolls into the Enlightenment, and then it's science essentially, that is the applied sciences uh, dogmatized into whatever science is supposed to be that more or less becomes now the queen and the idea of that theology is a science is now absurd to modern men. So, but we sh well, I should, uh, how about we do it? Yeah, let's do it private. So let's take a time out and uh, to stretch your legs, um, look at some books in the back and then we'll come back for the last talk tonight.